Hey, welcome to the How in the Health podcast. We are lucky to have Michelle Parker joining us for this episode. She is a speech language pathologist, and we'll be talking about how she and other speech language pathologists help people communicate more effectively, especially after strokes, injury, or surgery. Hope you enjoy. Michelle, thank you for being here. This is exciting. I was so happy to know that you would be coming on here. Um, and so thank you for being on How in the Health podcast. I'm really excited to be here. This is great. So I'm going to tell them the story of how this all came to be. So sure. Michelle and I go way back. And our previous episode with Donnie, the orthopedic surgeon, we both know Donnie. And Michelle heard that. And so she was like, oh, I'm in healthcare as well. And I didn't know that. And so I asked her what she does. And she told me a speech language pathologist, and I wanted to learn more about that. So I'm excited to learn what that is. Okay. So can you tell us what is a speech language pathologist to somebody that's like eight years old and doesn't know what that is? <laughs> okay. So I have to explain what I do almost every single day to every one of my patients, because most of the time I'm walking into their patient room and I say, hi, I'm the speech language pathologist. And most of them respond with, I already know how to talk. So I deal mostly with adults. Um, but a speech language pathologist works from birth to death, basically. We, we have a role in the entire lifespan. Um, but we, we kind of, I, I think a better name for us would be a communication therapist because we really deal with every aspect of communication, whether it be the sound of your voice, your ability to make certain sounds, your ability to communicate language effectively, your ability to think and process written and verbal information, and then we have this kind of interesting side area of swallowing disorders or dysphagia. So because it's the same system that you use to talk with, we also deal with swallowing, which is what I do mostly. Okay, so you do specialize in that, right? So some will just work with kids, or can you work with all of them? You just decide to work with? Yeah. So How does that work? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's kind of the draw to the field for most speech-language pathologists is that there are so many different areas that you can work in. So um, usually you do a lot of specialization out of school. We do like a, a year after we graduate called a clinical fellowship year, and that's kind of your special specialization year. And most people either take like a medical route or an education route. So a lot of people are familiar with like a speech language pathologist in a school setting where they help children either pronounce different sounds or help children who have language impairments. Um, so that they can participate better in the classroom. So that's more of an education route. And then there's the medical route where you can work in kind of some of those areas I mentioned. So voice therapy, um, speech, language, cognition, and then dysphagia, which is the swallowing disorders. What kind of training and education goes into you becoming a speech language pathologist? What does that look like? Yeah. Usually there's a couple years of undergraduate work that are specific to speech language pathology. It's usually called like communicative disorders and you can either go into speech language pathology from that bachelor's degree or audiology. So we kind of split after, you know, undergraduate year. And then in grad school, um, it's a master's degree in speech language pathology or if you go the audiology route, then you get a um, AUD or an audi or doctorate of audiology. Um, so audiology that, is just hearing? Right? Yep. So those are the people that test your hearing, fit you with cochlear implants or fit you with um, hearing aids, that kind of thing. So they kind of break off, although we start in the same place. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so it's a master's degree in speech language pathology. And then you do, after you graduate from that, you do one year of the fellowship and you kind of pick an area that you want to specialize in. When the, with the fellowship, how does that work? Is there like a fellowship program within the university that you got your master's in, or is it somewhere else? So it's actually not related to school. You basically go out and find a job that offers um, first year, like a fellowship program. And it's basically a mentored year mm -hmm. where you have a certain number of supervised hours and a certain number of like um, mentored hours and um, from a speech language pathologist who's you know been in the field for a certain number of years um, and then there's a lot of education during that year and basically learning what you need to do on the job with yeah. someone there to you know watch over you and make sure you don't totally mess up. 
Is there a way to totally mess up in this, in like speech language pathology? Um, yes, okay. <laughs> so, especially with the, the swallowing disorders, oh, because, yeah. you know, that's, that's one of the areas that if you, you know, have a problem with that and you don't fix it correctly, you could, you know, aspirate liquids into your lungs and cause infections and so forth. So, so before we started recording this, you mentioned one adult who came in to see you, but why would somebody visit you? How, how would they find out about you and then yeah. why would they come to you? So we are a big referral-based um, discipline, so especially with people who are adults because most of them are um, using some form of Medicare insurance and Medicare usually requires a referral. But typically um, in like an outpatient setting, for example, um, let's say you have a problem with your voice, your horse and something's not feeling right or you can't sing the notes that you used to be able to or you don't like the pitch or the tone of your voice so you typically you'd go see like an ear nose and throat doctor right and then that ear nose and throat doctor would say everything looks normal inside your throat but I can see that you've developed some sort of voice disorder so I'm going to refer you to our speech language pathologist who can do a specialized evaluation and then provide you with whatever therapy you need. Um, another route would be like if you've had a stroke, for example, and maybe you have some deficits related to your speech or swallow mm -hmm. from the stroke. And typically your neurologist would set, a, set you up with a speech language pathologist that's specialized in neuro based rehab mm -hmm. um, and, you know, other areas as well. <laughs> There's, so typically it's a referral system. Okay, so you mentioned like stroke. Is it other injuries that could prompt something like that? Is there some sort of like trauma? I've heard of people who go like mute or whatever thing like that. Is that related or not related? Oh, like emotional trauma? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So we do have, um, and especially in voice, voice therapy or voice disorders, there's definitely like an emotional aspect. So I don't know if you've ever tried to talk while you're crying, but it's really, really difficult, right? Yeah. Or you see people get choked up. That's where that phrase comes from. So um, voice is actually very much controlled by your emotions. And so if someone's going through a period of like extreme stress, it can definitely affect their voice, um, especially if they're building like muscle tension in that area. So that can all affect that. So, um, but like you're talking about the mute, somebody who, you know, there's a, a disorder usually you see in small children called selective mutism, which they basically choose not to talk in certain situations because of some sort of stress factor that's making them not want to do that. That's interesting. So if you have an adult or child in that instance, is that more kind of a psychological thing that you're helping them through versus, I mean, making sounds as we talked about? Yeah, absolutely, because their system is functional, so it works the way it should. It's just that they're choosing not to really use it in certain settings, and so you'd um, collaborate pretty heavily with, like, a child psychologist in that instance. How often do you work with people where English isn't their primary language? A lot. <laughs> yeah. Take us through that. Like, <laughs> what, is, what does that look like? Yeah, so that, that adds a little level of difficulty, especially if you're assessing speech or language, right? So let's say I'm, um, I primarily work as an inpatient speech language pathologist, so I'm dealing with people who are hospitalized, ex and usually they're extremely sick or um, they have some form of acute illness that's causing them to have uh, a need for me to come see them. And we have a large Spanish-speaking population here in Utah, and occasionally we get other languages as well. So it can be difficult to assess someone's ability to produce accurate language if I don't speak that language. So we have some really great interpreters that come and kind of help us, and then we can follow most assessments with the help of an interpreter, but it definitely adds a level of difficulty onto that. So we rely pretty heavily on family as well to kind of help us understand how far away from normal their family member is in terms of, you know, their speech and language. That was another question I had was kind of what is the family's role in what you do, right? I mean, is it something where you're, you're helping the patient figure out how they can fix something, mm -hmm. but then you're also educating the family on, look, when they do go home, here are some things to keep in mind. Yeah, so um, family is an extremely important aspect of your prognosis. We, every time we do an evaluation, we um, assess kind of, or we make an assessment of their, you know, their prognosis, whether it's like good or fair or, you know, not very good, I guess is the way we would say that. And 
some of the factors that could influence that are definitely the level of support they have at home. So um, like an example would be um, if I'm working with somebody who has, you know, a swallowing disorder and they're unable to swallow certain textures of food or liquids um, and we would send them home on a modified diet and that's really important for family to be involved so that they kind of support that type of diet or that texture of food um, and not tempt them with other things that might be <laughs> dangerous to yeah. their health. So family is an extremely important um, and then, you know, also with like communication, if some, if a family member isn't able to effectively communicate with the rest of their family, it can take an extreme like emotional toll on the family. Yeah. Um, if they can't, you know, communicate well with their family member or their loved one. That's interesting. Cause I feel like that emotional stress would be on both sides, right? One is the person trying to mm-hmm. help and the other one is the person trying to express mm-hmm. what's going on. Like, I feel like that would be really hard. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we learn about communication as a two-way street. So it's actually really important to involve the family member. So um, communication doesn't just come from the speaker, right? The listener also plays an extremely important role. So when, if I have like speech that is slurred or you can't understand very well, my message isn't getting across and the listener's also not receiving that message. So it, you know, there's a massive communication breakdown there and that can be extremely frustrating, especially for humans, how our primary mode of message transportation is verbal. That's so interesting. And, and so what, what can somebody expect if they, they learn from their ENT or some other doctor, like, hey, you should go see a speech language pathologist. Mm-hmm. What can they expect from that first meeting and subsequent meetings? I know in your case, I guess they're injured and they're in a the hospital, but is that an initial consultation? Let's see how you're doing and then set up a plan or what does mm-hmm. that look like? Yeah, so it's kind of different um, based on which setting that you're working in. So for an inpatient setting, usually I would receive an order on the computer and I would go visit with that that patient and do my assessment on the first meeting, um, whether or not that or whether that's like a language or speech or swallowing assessment or cognitive assessment. And then any subsequent visits, if that person needs you know therapy then we would see them usually on a daily basis for 30 to 60 minutes. Um, They're a little bit shorter and a little bit less structured uh, as an inpatient just because we're trying to fit and kind of fit that patient in with the rest of our schedule and their schedule and everything. Um, But usually we'd see them on a daily basis and make kind of ongoing assessments as they improve. On an, in an acute setting like that, we have a very limited time with that patient. Usually hospital stays are, you know, anywhere from like three to seven days on average, right? So um, if they weren't completely fixed or if their problem wasn't, you know, optimal by the time they're ready to discharge medically, then we could refer them to outpatient therapy or home health-based therapy. And in that setting... They would receive another evaluation to kind of see where they're at there. And then um, the dosage of therapy would be dependent on their impairment. So Mm -hmm. usually once or twice a week for as many weeks as necessary. So we don't usually give a time frame because it's very dependent on a lot of factors. So when you're dealing with inpatient and then they go and they're going home, Mm -hmm. is that you're passing it on to another speech language pathologist? You don't get a key stay with them? through that process no that would be great but no that's not that's not how it works yeah so usually you're confined to your one setting so um yeah if I was referring a patient for therapy outside of the inpatient hospital setting then they'd go to see a different different speech language pathologist who specializes in outpatient rehab so when I first think of this well first my mind went to kids right because we have family members who for example a child has autism and so mm-hmm. they go to a speech language language pathologist to help with that um but especially i guess both in my mind i feel like there's a problem and we need to fix it and is that how it works or are you trying to get to where okay they can't make a sound or they can't swallow and then they can or is it trying to make improvements over like what is that is it fixing a problem every time i mean that's typically our goal but i think optimizing a problem is probably a better way to look at it and a little bit more realistic. So, and it, and it really depends on why they're there. So, um, like let's say we just have somebody who's inpatient hospital. Maybe they've been in the ICU for a while. They've been intubated. 
and now they've got like um you know some some swallowing problems because their you know trachea was had a tube down it right yeah. so that's hopefully a transient problem it's going to go away soon and we're going to help them through that process there are other ones that are a little more permanent. So maybe somebody's had a head and neck cancer that they've had to remove part of the structure of their throat or their larynx or something like that. And so we may not have the same swallow that you've had before when you had a complete full system, but maybe we can optimize that the best possible way so that you can continue to enjoy food and beverage the way that you want to. But it might feel a little bit different or you might have to put some sort of compensatory strategy in place to make it a safe way for you to eat and drink. So it just kind of depends on what they're there for and what they have to work with. And you mentioned the referral system. So I'm thinking in my mind, there, there may be people out there who could really benefit from a speech language pathologist, but they don't know it because they aren't visiting a doctor for any, any other ailments or something. So how can somebody know, oh, hey, maybe I could benefit from something like this without like a severe injury? Yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of um, one of the things that we're working on as speech-language pathologists as a field is trying to get more recognition or more awareness of what we do. Everyone knows what a physical therapist is, right? Some people know what an occupational therapist is, but not everybody knows what a speech-language pathologist is, and we're all kind of the same. In the hospital, we kind of refer to ourselves as the other other therapy because we're the ones that people know the least about. So I really think it's... it's um, education and just kind of spreading awareness about our you know what we what we do and what we can offer for services so um but we like I mean we do rely pretty heavily on referrals just because the doctors are the ones who know about us but even in that area there's some growth that could be done Mm -hmm. you know understanding that we're available and we we can offer some really great services to their patients yeah what is your what's your favorite part about what you do Um, I really enjoy the inpatient setting because I get to see and work with a lot of different kinds of people. So it's never boring. I get to work on, um, you know, people from all walks of life, all different backgrounds. And then I get to work in a lot of different areas of speech language pathology. So I never know what I'm going to get when I walk into a patient's room. I could walk in there and have, you know, someone who speaks Bosnian and needs me to help them with, you know, language impairment. And that, you know, is extremely challenging. Or then I can go to the next room and it's somebody who's been in like a traumatic car accident and they've had like a craniectomy and part of their brain removed and I have to help them with cognition. So I'm never bored at work. I get to, I get to see and work with a lot of different types of people and disorders. That's pretty fascinating. I mean, I'm sure you've seen some crazy stuff that <laughs> goes on. And yeah. We don't have to get too in detail on that. <laughs> but what's kind of like the most challenging part of what you do? Yeah, I think, um, you know, on the other side of the coin there, that is challenging, right, to work with a lot of different kinds of people and being able to kind of not really code switch, but switch your focus pretty rapidly between patients and mm-hmm. Um, manage a lot of different personalities as well as a lot of different disorders in a single day and I don't when I go to work I don't have like a schedule set out for me I set that for myself so I kind of triage my patients based on need and and just make sure that everybody gets seen Um, I think over the last year specifically it's been extremely challenging um, working with like COVID pandemic and kind of navigating our way around that Um, in the hospital setting, that's been extremely challenging, especially this last year. So, yeah. do you are you communicating with their attending physicians? I mean, is there a group of you that's all? I mean, you're passing along what you've learned to the physician, who can then make decisions off of that as well. Or is it kind of pretty siloed? Yeah, no, we're we're definitely working with the physicians. So, um, the same way that we'd get like a referral for outpatient services, inpatient, we're kind of more of a consult, right? So the the attending or the resident, because I work in a teaching hospital, would put an order in for a speech-language pathology consult, and then we would go and do our assessment and then communicate our findings back to the physician. Typically, they need our input in order to understand what type of diet they want to put them on, um, if they're appropriate for a diet, or if they need like a feeding tube or something. Um, And then 
Um, we also work pretty heavily with the social workers or the case managers who are maybe placing somebody in like a skilled nursing facility or outpatient therapy to assess what needs they have after they're discharged. So it's a pretty collaborative team. And we have to do a lot of communicating with other <laughs> medical professionals, which is great because that's our specialty. So Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I, going back, I'm kind of all over the place right that's now because okay. things keep um, coming into my head, but if there's a swallowing disorder, I think of the medications that people have to take, right? And so if it's a pill, mm-hmm. is that something where that might influence whether it's a pill or an injectable or a, something else? Yeah, that's actually the number one thing that nurses like us for is I get called on this probably... I don't know, 15 times a day, a nurse will call me and say, I need to give this pill. How is this patient supposed to take it? And so we can modify, you can crush the pill, put it in a spoonful of applesauce, you can stick it through a feeding tube, or we can have it changed to a liquid form that would go through an IV. Um, but yeah, we so we always make a diet recommendation, a liquid recommendation, and then a medication recommendation. Awesome. Is yeah. this something where you would potentially be on call, or is that does that, does that apply here? Sometimes, yeah. So there are certain certain instances where you would be on call. It varies based on the hospital you work at. So at like a trauma one hospital, we're staffed all the time, mm-hmm. seven days a week. We've got seven, six to seven speech therapists on per day. Um, in a small, more like community-based hospital, you might have somebody on call like on a holiday or a weekend that would come in for like emergent evaluations. Typically someone who's had like a stroke right that minute and they need to have an assessment right away before we do any sort of medication administration or language or, um, you know, diet ordering. Yeah, yeah, interesting. What kind of research is going on in this field? Yeah, so over the last year, the research has been primarily the effects of COVID on different areas with speech-language pathology. So we've definitely had uh, a huge impact on swallowing disorders and voice disorders um, related to COVID. That's kind of the two main areas that it's been affecting, but also cognition. So there's some evidence to show that um, COVID can affect the nervous system as well. So it can impact your central nervous system and cause cognitive impairments. Um, So that's been kind of the primary over the last year. But um, looking forward into like the future, I think um, research is going to focus a lot on kind of optimizing what we do or kind of streamlining what we do. So our field is fairly young in terms of like the history of medicine. Yeah. So we we kind of started after World War II when people came home with like hearing impairments from blasts and or PTSD sometimes. And so that's kind of where we were born. And so our research is fairly new. We've relied heavily on like other Um, disciplines like obviously neurology and even physical medicine and rehab and so we're kind of trying to bulk up the speech language pathology research and and get it more specific to what we do and um, obviously we we still borrow from other disciplines and other fields to kind of guide us in our evidence-based practice but yeah so we're we're just kind of trying to add to our body of research as much as we can. What kind of technology do you get to use or that have you seen used in this field? So AAC devices or alternative and augmentative communication devices is probably one of our most well-known things. So if you think of like Stephen Hawking, right, and he had his little computer that would speak for him. So that's an AAC device. So that's one of our, I mean, I think our most interesting technology that we we might use. And so... How is that working? Is that using eye movements or how is... What is that using to pick what he wants to say? Yeah, so he uses an eye gaze system. So it um, it's specific to where his eyes are and how fast they move from picture to picture or from letter to letter. Um, and so it just maps his eye movements and he kind of, you know, would... Like swipe on the text thing? Almost, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then they have other versions that if people have motor, motor control, they can use their fingers or there's like toggle systems, lots of different different ways that you can use those. We use that sometimes with children who have pretty severe forms of autism, who maybe are nonverbal. They, that can kind of bridge the gap from getting them to communicate in a way. So AAC is it's a really cool, really cool area. I don't get to do as, lo- as much of it in an inpatient setting, but yeah, it's a really cool one. And then one that we do get to use occasionally inpatient is like um, electrical stimulation. So 
we would maybe put electrodes on different muscles or muscle groups in your throat and activate those while you do swallow therapy so you can improve the function of the muscles. That's interesting. And when you're looking at the muscles to see what the problem may be, is this an x-ray? Is this What, what is you using from that perspective to get a look into what muscles are? So, are going that's on? a really good question. <laughs> so this is a... So instrumental swallow evaluations are separate from what I might do when I go to a patient's room and do like a bedside swallow assessment. So that would involve, a bedside swallow assessment would involve me bringing in certain textures of food, having the patient eat and drink in front of me and kind of making my assessment based on what I can see. Um, If we need to go deeper and do a more thorough evaluation, we would do an instrumental swallow evaluation. And we have two that we regularly use. One is a Um, video fluoroscopy, which is basically an x-ray machine using a fluoro machine, and we have them drink barium, which is radio opaque, so we can see it on an x-ray and assess their swallow function that way. Or we have um, a flexible scope, like an endoscope that we can insert through their nose, um, and then we kind of watch them drink and eat textures of food that we've dyed, either blue or green, so that we can see them. Um, and assess more visually that way. So that sounds pretty unpleasant. It's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just my COVID test that went through my nose felt like... Yeah, but the COVID test is worse because they're sticking that swab all the way back and trying to touch the back of your throat, right? The nasopharynx back there. And so they're scraping cells and stuff from the back of that. We are very gentle when we go through and we try to avoid that area. So yeah, the nose part is, obviously your nose is very tender, but once we get into the throat, you shouldn't feel anything other than like, if you swallow, it might feel like you have a spaghetti noodle or something that you forgot to swallow. Perfect. (laughs) Yeah. You just painted such a good picture. That's great. It's not as bad as you think. Yeah. What kind of research did you participate in through your, I, I don't know if it was necessarily an undergrad or just master's, but in general. Yeah, so I um, was lucky enough to work in a research lab during graduate school. Um, It was part of kind of my assistantship and scholarships to get through schooling. So um, I worked in a lab with um, a really wonderful professor up at Utah State. Her name is Stephanie Borey, and she uh, specializes mostly in communication and kind of the communication loop between the speaker and the listener. So she works pretty heavily with patients who have something called dysarthria, which is a speech, a motor speech disorder that um, affects the clarity of your speech, and usually there's some sort of neurologic issue that's causing that, so um, like a stroke or somebody who maybe has Parkinson's disease and their speech gets affected by um, the, you know, the process of or the progressive decline of Parkinson's. So we did, um, I worked on a lot of research with her, and then I did a thesis in grad school that was... um, a little bit more voice-based, so I um, basically took different recordings of different voice characteristics or voice features and assigned um, number, or basically I, I sent them out into the research world and I had people rate them on intelli- like on how intelligent they perceived that person to be based on their voice characteristics, how likable they were, and then kind of Um, figured out which speech and voice characteristics lend themselves to someone appearing intelligent or appearing likable or the opposite, not intelligent and not likable. So how would you explain vocal fry? (laughs) Yes, I I worked pretty heavily on vocal fry in that. Uh, Vocal fry sounds a lot like this, (laughs) so very fried, kind of like a motorboat. Um, Vocal fry is like this pretty culturally a phenomenon lately, especially in women. And I think I can't back this up with a lot of research, but anecdotally, I think women have lowered their pitch quite a bit over time. I mean, if you think back to like housewives in the 1950s, right, they kind of talked like, oh, I'm going to go cook a roast and I've got this really whimsical feminine voice. And I think over time as like, you know, feminist movement has grown, we've kind of lowered our voice into a more authoritarian voice, right? And um, with that, pitch change comes a little bit of vocal fry. Perfect. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> we can and we can link because I actually saw your speech. Mm-hmm. Is that what it was? It was a speech at some conference about this? Yeah. And so we can put a link in that in the show notes so people can go watch it. But okay. Go and enjoy. I mean, Vocal Fry was one of them, right? And then mm-hmm. how high or low their voice is, and then how quickly they speak, right? Are those yeah. So that you were looking at? the three features that I focused on mostly with my research were yeah, Vocal Fry. Sometimes it's called Glottal Fry. Um, how high or low their pitch is relative to normal, and then how fast or slow someone speaks. So I, there's been a lot of speculation that people who speak with vocal fry are perceived as non-intelligent. So I wanted to kind of see if that was the only feature that caused that perception or if it was um, vocal fry in the context of someone who speaks slowly or at a high pitch or at a low pitch and not just that one specific feature because... There are so many features in your voice that lend themselves to the perceptions that people make of you. Yeah, oh, that's fun. Um, because I think a lot of times I, from the anecdotal perspective, I'm kind of like, oh, I assume this is happening, mm-hmm. right? But to be actually, to be able to go and actually test it, I think would be pretty interesting. Yeah, we make um, a lot of assumptions on people based on what they sound like. And a lot of it is also influenced by what you look like. So if you remove the visual, mm-hmm. what does just their voice tell you about them? How do you how do you combat that personally as you go in? Like you said, you're seeing so many different patients and with a variety of backgrounds and ethnicities and everything else. How can you kind of remove that as you go in and address the situation that needs to be handled? With my own voice or with theirs? <laughs> Let's go with both. <laughs> um, do you, I, really though, like do you find yourself talking louder or more slowly to people who don't have English as their primary language? Yes, I think that I think there is definitely things that we subconsciously do mm-hmm. naturally when we're speaking with somebody who maybe has some sort of communication difference. The common misconception is that person who speaks a different language or maybe who's hard of hearing needs you to slow down mm-hmm. and talk really slowly, right? But that's actually not that helpful, I found, in some situations. Obviously, speaking louder is going to help somebody who has a hearing impairment. So I do that a lot. I yell a lot at work at work because um, I'm working with primarily elderly people and a lot of them their batteries in their hearing aids die or they forget to bring them into the hospital. So I do speak louder for my patients with hearing impairments. And then we just, if we have someone with a different language, it's just, you have to use an interpreter. It's the only way that you can effectively communicate. And legally we have to use an interpreter anyway, um, or at least offer one. A patient can turn it down if they don't want it. But yeah, interpreters are the best way to do that. Um, and then in terms of like personalities, I definitely change the way that I approach people based on the perceptions that I get from them and what they need in the moment. So um, a good example would be somebody who has like a traumatic brain injury, like a fresh one. So let's say they were in a car accident yesterday and they have a you know traumatic brain gen- injury today. Typically those people can be a little bit um, aggressive or agitated initially. So if I came in there and I was like, hey, I'm the speech therapist, I'm here to work with you, that wouldn't be very good. So usually we use kind of like a softer tone, like very calming, we don't turn the lights on, Mm -hmm. we kind of ease into it and that helps us get, you know, an in with that person. Yeah, Yeah. that's so interesting because I think, I, I don't know, my perception is if you're going in to treat somebody Try and treat everybody the same, right? But I think that, again, depending on why they're there, there can be a lot of frustration as they're trying. I mean, and just the different personalities of people in general as they get frustrated, some get aggressive, some just shut down. They just don't want to deal with it. They don't want to try hard at certain things that are tough. I don't know. I think that'd be a tough thing to manage all the time, (laughs) not just in speech language pathology, but in medicine in general, right, of those personalities. I think that's probably the hardest part of medicine um, is being able to manage your own, how you come across and in order to like assist that patient the best way that you can. And a lot of that is switching your approach from room to room to room, just so that you can, and you kind of have to pick up on those clues really quickly because I have to get buy-in from my patients within like 30 seconds of being there so that they can be agreeable to my session, right? And so I have to make a pretty quick assessment of what they need from me and kind of alter the way I approach them yeah. based on that. Do you, do you find yourself kind of taking your work home? So as you're interacting with friends and family, like are you noticing their speech patterns? Like right now, you're like, man, Eric says um a lot or he struggles making these sounds. I mean, 
Can you separate the two or is it kind no. of always with you? <laughs> I definitely can't separate the two. So like I can't watch television without assessing everybody's speech. So yeah, I'm, I, we, we call it the curse of the speech language pathologist. You're constantly assessing people when everyone's talk. when you meet a new person, they're talking at you and you're definitely making yeah. mental assessments of what they're doing. <laughs> After this, we'll have to, have to get the assessment on. Like, I've already made it for you. You're good. Yeah, you can type that up for me. Um, so how did you get into healthcare in general, and then why the direction of a speech-language pathologist? Yeah, so I had a pretty um, long route into healthcare. I didn't go straight into speech-language pathology out of high school or, you know, first into college. Um, I kind of was following the path of my older sister, who is a nurse, and I thought, oh, we're pretty similar. She's a nurse. I'll probably like that too. So I started going to school to get into like nursing school and that that um, route. And then got a job as a certified nurse's assistant or a CNA. And that gave me a really big insight into what nurses do. And although nurses are some of the hardest working people in the hospital, I realized that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I was really glad that I got that opportunity to kind of get a firsthand view of it. So I, um, you know, I kind of threw around a couple other ideas. I, I entertained becoming like um, like elementary education, mm-hmm. um, but ultimately I knew I wanted to be in the medical field somehow. So I really love kind of the procedural aspect of healthcare, where you get to do cool things like stick cameras up people's noses and whatnot. <laughs> So um, while I was working at a, as a CNA, I met some speech therapists who were at the hospital, and they kind of showed me what they do and explained it a little bit to me, and I thought, that is me, perfect. They are a very science-based field, but they also get to work with language, which are kind of my two favorite areas all growing up in school, and so it just fit perfectly for me. Nice. That's yeah. Cool. And you're glad you made that decision? Yeah, (laughs) yeah. What does the career outlook look like for a speech-language pathologist? Is there more education you get? Is there there just kind of you've got your thing and you can switch specialties back and forth? Or how does that that Uh, work? It can be difficult to switch specialties back and forth, so I would never feel comfortable going and working in a school at this point. I have not spent enough time learning how to do that. So, um so we kind of you kind of pick a path and then you can grow a little bit within that path. So um, I obviously started in voice and dysphagia, and I've kind of worked my way into like inpatient, which I deal with a little bit more neuro like neuro based impairments and trauma based impairments. And so I kind of have grown and learned that on the job. Um, and currently, I'm kind of training to learn how to do NICU based speech therapy. So with neonatals patients who are premature and have um, like feeding impairments and such like that. So I'm kind of, it's kind of related, right? But obviously a very opposite area. Yeah. Um, so there, you know, there's kind of ongoing education. We, we have to get a certain number of continuing education units every year. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get a PhD or a clinical doctorate in speech language pathology, but usually those people go into more teaching and research versus clinical practice. Yeah. Wow. That's super cool. Do you have a story you can tell us of kind of a beginning to end of they came in with this problem, worked through some things, and then after the fact, everything is back to normal. Back to normal. Well, what is normal? That's the real question. (laughs) That's a good question. No. um, Yeah. So I can tell you kind of a typical typical route of a person maybe who's had a stroke. That's a pretty common one that we would see. So um, so someone comes into the usually the emergency department with signs of a stroke. They get imaging done that confirms the location or the severity of that stroke. And then speech-language pathology is consulted. We would go and see that patient and do um, like a swallow assessment for sure. We do that on every patient who's had a stroke because strokes are one of the leading causes of dysphagia. And then we would kind of make, you know, obser- observations on how they're speaking if, and also based on the location of the stroke, what other types of assessments we would need to do. So typically if they've had a stroke on the left side of their brain, they're going to have a language impairment. And if they've had a stroke on the right side of the brain, they're going to have more of a cognitive impairment. Mm-hmm. That's not always the case, but for the most part. 
So, um, and then based on what we find, we would see them daily to make our, to do our therapy. So if they had a swallowing impairment, we would do one of those instrumental assessments, Mm -hmm. identify the pathophysiology or the, the impairments deficits, and then target those specifically. So let's say they had uh, poor laryngeal vestibule closure, which is basically... Which we all know what that means. Yeah, for sure. That's <laughs> basically the opening to the airway. Okay. So if they don't have good closure or tight closure of that during the swallow, then you're at risk for getting liquids or solids into your airway, and that can drop into your lungs, right? Which is where we don't want our food or liquid to go. So we would target exercises that would strengthen that closure or improve that closure. Um, typically, they would do a lot on a regular basis, like... We, we aim for like 100 to 300 exercises a day. Wow. Um, and then over time, we would do a, another assessment to assess progress after a few days. Um, and then if they've made Im- improvements, we could maybe change their diet at that point. So maybe before they were aspirating thin liquids, and so we may have thickened their liquids or changed the way that they swallowed liquids, like told them they needed to like, take small sips only, because if they took large sips, then they were more likely to aspirate or something like that. And then we kind of make our assessments after that. And then if they were ready to go home medically, like they were medically stable, not appropriate for an inpatient stay, um, or they were ready for rehab, then we would send you know our notes on to the rehab or outpatient speech-language pathologist who would pick up where we left off. After a stroke, your recovery period is like pretty intense for the first few months, three to six months, yeah. and then you kind of plateau, and then after about a year, you're kind of where you're going to be. There's obviously some improvements that can continue to happen after that with pretty intensive therapy, but we really like to get in there and work really hard within the first couple of weeks to months, because that's when the most, most growth happens mm-hmm. after a stroke. So you've mentioned a stroke, you've mentioned Parkinson's, are there any other kind of diseases that contribute to what you do? I don't know if dementia, Alzheimer's comes into play, like what other, I guess, kind of ailments come, come across you besides, I mean, traumatic injuries, but mm-hmm. are there certain diseases that? Yeah, so dementia is a big one. Dementia is highly correlated with swallowing disorders, communicative disorders, and cognitive impairment, obviously. Um, so we do work with a fair number of patients who have dementia, um, Other progressive neurologic diseases like Huntington's disease or ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. So those are obviously ones that cause communication impairments. Head and neck cancer or anytime you're removing structures from the speech mechanism, um, that's going to definitely affect your ability to swallow or talk or depending on what they take. And that's actually a really growing area of speech pathology or growing area in general, head and neck cancer. So... Um, we're getting a lot more hmm. referrals for that. So a lot of the stuff with from the medical world as coming from an insurance carrier, mm-hmm. a lot of it was like prevention. Yes. It sounds like this is treatment based. Is there also a prevention aspect of this? We're like, okay, right now in my thirties or as you get into certain ages, are there things that you can do to possibly prevent needing to come see you? <laughs> that sounded right. wrong. No, that's <laughs> not that's good. No, I I think, um, well, there are a couple areas that definitely we we deal with prevention. So um, obviously dementia, we're still kind of learning about the process of developing dementia, but there is some research to support, you know, keeping your mind active as after retirement or as you age and, and reading a lot, those kind of things kind of keeping or reducing your risk of developing dementia as well as diet factors, right? What you eat can definitely do that. So that's kind of a preventative measure. Voice disorders, there's a lot of preventative things that you can do, whether it's not smoking, right? That's kind of one of the things that can cause voice disorders or um, making sure you hydrate really well. Avoiding phonotrauma, which are things like yelling or clearing your throat. Managing illnesses or, you know, things that would make voice disorders worse, like reflux or gastroesophageal reflux. One of the main areas that we do, like actual preventative treatment, is head and neck cancer. So if you've had, if you have head and neck cancer and your plan, let's say your treatment consists of radiation and chemo, we love when 
the doctors will refer them before they go through that, and we give them what's called prehab, where we teach them how to maintain swallow function because radiation can really impact the movement, range of motion, and the function of like your speech and swallow mechanism. So if we teach them certain things they can do during radiation, their long-term outcomes are far better than if they wait till after radiation to come see us because then we're trying to undo things rather than prevent them from happening. That's really cool. Yeah. That's awesome. You mentioned hydration. I'm going to take a drink. Good idea. Unofficial sponsor, Owala Water Bottles and Great Value Purified Drinking Water. We're sponsored by Great Value? Unofficially. (laughs) Unofficially sponsored. (laughs) That would be a really cool sponsor. Yeah. Is that that a Costco brand? I don't even know where that came from. I think that's Walmart. Walmart? Walmart brand, yeah. Sorry, Walmart. Now they're definitely not going to be an official sponsor. What questions haven't I asked that I should have? Because you mentioned like educating people around what you do is important. We've kind of gone over a lot. Is there anything that we've missed that would be helpful from a speech language pathologist's point of view of potential patients or physicians or anybody else out there? Like, what have we missed? One of the things that we like to to drive home about speech therapy, you know, all of the aspects of you know our field is that we are a behavioral therapy so there's not a magic pill that you can give you to help you swallow better or to speak better there are some therapy I mean pharmaceutical like things that doctors can add to your treatment plan that might help but for the most part we are non-pharmaceutical which is kind of a nice option for some people right so you go in you do the hard work and usually you have longer outcomes that are long lasting so there's a lot of I think a lot of people are looking for that type of treatment these days right so I think that's one of the benefits of, of speech pathology is that we we don't prescribe <laughs> medicine for you. So, um, But also I think another thing that people can do when they go see their doctors if they have something, even if they don't know what a speech pathologist is, is just to ask questions to their physician and say, what other things might be available to me for this problem that I'm dealing with? Or are there other treatment options other than you know, just taking this pill, or how could I enhance my outcomes? Um, And usually if you're asking those questions, your doctors can point you in the right direction. So, um, yeah, maybe you've had a, like, you know, we keep going back to stroke, but it's one of the more common ones. And so, like, maybe you've had a stroke, you've, your doctor's like, okay, I'm going to put you on a blood thinner to prevent this from happening again. We're going to put you on a blood pressure medication, you know, and then the if you take one step further and say, well, what can I do to make sure that I can swallow normally or talk or communicate effectively, you know, then you can have that referral to speech pathology and we can help you not only optimize your, or reduce your risk of having the next stroke, but also like optimize your ability to be the person you were before the stroke, hopefully. Yeah. No, this is super valuable for me too, right? Because I, I haven't had a stroke, but if yeah. any family member does to know like, Hey, go, yeah, check this out as well. It'll absolutely. Super useful. And right. if you have a stroke, go to the ED right away. Okay. Don't wait. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's the signs of a stroke, but we won't get into that. Yeah. Um, all right. One more kind of question that's not necessarily SLP related, and then we're going to have three get in, getting to know you questions. Okay. You ready for those? I'm ready. I hope you're ready for those. But over the course of kind of your education, your research, your career, how has your understanding of people and what it means to be human changed? Um, that's a really in-depth question. I think I learn something new about people every day. Mm-hmm. I think just being exposed to different kinds of people helps me understand a little bit more about what we need. I think one of the best parts about my field is that I really help people with the things that are most important to them, right? Right being able to communicate, that's kind of what makes us human is is being able to do that. And so um, it's, a, it's a really rewarding area, um, and it means different things to different people. So I think, you know, the best, I guess, what I've learned the most about people is just that people need to be able to communicate with others in order to be happy and to be human. And that's kind of at the basis of what makes us who we are. And um, that, you know, in in the inpatient setting, people are usually pretty scared. 
It's kind of a scary thing to be hospitalized and you don't really know what's going on. And, and so small things make a big difference in that person's, you know, quality of life, just being willing to listen to them or help them in small ways um, really makes big impacts. That's really cool. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to shift away from the serious stuff. Okay. <laughs> All right, question number one. You win $100 million after tax. Oh, what, after tax. After tax, so you don't have nice. to worry about taxes. What's the first thing that you buy for yourself and why? So you can't go paying off other people's stuff. You can't go buying stuff for other people. What's the first thing you buy for yourself? Probably a Tesla. A Tesla. <laughs> which, which model? Um, Cybertruck? I do like the Cybertruck. Yeah. I think I'd be slightly embarrassed to drive it. I'll wait till maybe more people have the Tesla truck. Okay. I really love the Model Y. Okay. So yeah, that's what I'd buy. It's it makes a small dent in my hundred million dollars, but that's probably the first thing I'd go for. That's fantastic. I wanted to get the t- Cyber Truck just to be weird, right? Because like, how do yeah. you roll up into any event? I mean, even into your driveway, and it's just not one of those like, what is that? Don't you think that people are going to throw stuff at the Cybertruck, though, when they like see it? proof and I know, proof. but people are going to do that on purpose. They're going to be like, see that? And, like, chuck something oh, at it. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> Stop shooting my windows. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, question number two. Okay. It's the Super Bowl. You have a one-minute ad spot. You can't sell it. You have to fill it with something. What do you do with one minute of the world's attention? That is a really difficult question. I don't necessarily think I want the world's attention. I don't know. <laughs> Probably something funny. Yeah. I don't know. I think the best Super, Co- Super Bowl commercials are the ones that are funny. You know, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Sorry, I've never, ever wanted the world's attention. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be you. Okay, but, but like, like what does the world mean? Out, what is the message you're throwing out there? Be nice to everybody. I don't know. I think we need something more uplifting like that in the world. Okay, you have 59 more seconds to fill. <laughs> <laughs> no commercial fishing. <laughs> <laughs> don't go to SeaWorld. Yeah, there you go. All those things. Perfect. <laughs> All right, last one. Okay. I've been tempted to do, so this is a would you rather. Okay. Would you rather, okay, I have two here, but we'll, we'll go with the normal. Would you rather go back to age five with everything that you know now, so the knowledge of everything you know now, or would you rather know everything your future self will learn right now? Probably go back to age five yeah. with everything I know now. Why? Um, although there's, like, obviously some really good benefits to learning as you go along, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes you can avoid I, – I imagine I could have avoided some – life mistakes that I've made along the way if I had a little bit more knowledge. Yeah. Um, definitely frontal lobe development, you know, that you need when you're a teenager and you don't have. It would be nice to have a little bit of that information before you get to that age. Yep. Yep. I've always thought about, the, like, that's just for kicks and giggles that happens. Mm-hmm. So now I'm five years old, and I theoretically know more than my parents. Yeah. Right? So how do you communicate that to your parents of like, hey, you're wrong. I'm a genius five-year-old. It doesn't work very well, even when you're an adult. Yeah. By the way, in 12 years, <laughs> things are going to get really weird with you guys. So, I guess it would depend on if they believed you, Yeah. I'd which maybe they them. wouldn't. I'd have to convince them. Um, oh. If you could only have one other leader in healthcare come on this podcast, who should we talk to? So... Um, I think what's been missing in healthcare awareness is talking to people who aren't leaders. Yeah. And people who actually do the work. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes it and especially during COVID it has been slightly frustrating to have administrators speak for the people who are on the front lines. Yeah. And I think there is a lot of value in talking to people who are actually doing the work. Talk to the nurses talk to the CNAs, talk to the housekeepers, talk to the, you know, physicians who are actually doing the work Mm -hmm. and maybe not the person who's removed from that, who's maybe leading an organization. Obviously, they've probably been been named the spokesperson, but 
you know, the input that the people who are actually doing on the ground, doing the work have, I think is some of the most valuable input that you can have. So I would say, don't look for the leaders, look for the people who are actually doing it. Perfect. That's really good advice. Mm -hmm. Well, that's all I have for this. And this has been super great. Like really. Yeah, it's been fun. Thank you. This is awesome. So yeah, we'll link to your fantastic research and speech in our show notes and anything else if we've misspoken we can edit that out (laughs) and yeah this is great so again michelle thank you yeah thank you it's been fun hey as we wrap up this episode we just wanted to let you know that we record these live so sometimes we misspeak or say things that we didn't mean to we also run each episode by some other outside experts just to make sure that we got all of our facts straight So in the show description, you'll find a link to some more information around the topics that we discussed. So be sure to check that out. And if you enjoyed this episode and want to hear others like it, be sure to subscribe. Again, thanks for listening.